is a story of survival, of a people who overcame a devastating natural disaster and a century and a half of colonial suppression to gain legal title to their land. Since time immemorial, Kaliaksum Lisms, the River Nass, and the mountains which surround it have been home to the Nishka people. The dark beauty of the cedar-clad hillsides have inspired legends of mystery and wonder. Eagles circle and swoop towards the great river, which offers sustenance and life to all creatures. As Britain's power spread round the world, merchant adventurers sought their fortunes in the rich lands of North America, which were still under the control of the crown. King George III's proclamation of 1763 decrees that Indian people should not be disturbed in their use and enjoyment of the land. The proclamation also states that any land held by Indians is to be purchased by the crown only, not by individuals, and that all purchases have to be agreed on by the Indian people and only after an open negotiating session In 1780, there came a terrible disaster. A huge volcano erupted. The boiling sea of lava poured down the valley, pushing the river up against the mountains to the north. It was a terrifying and tragic time. More than 3,000 people perished in the fire and noxious gases. The vast lava beds are respected as a sacred memorial. Just 13 years later, in 1793, Captain George Vancouver dropped anchor in Observatory Inlet, close to Kincoleth. His logbook is now in the British Library in London, England. Peaceful Nishka villagers canoed to greet him, but were offered nothing of value to trade. This was first contact with the white man. From the 1830s on, European immigrants, trappers and loggers invaded northern British Columbia and Hudson Bay posts were established. The land grab had begun. Canneries at Fishery Bay on the Nass employed many local people. In the settlements along the river, totem poles were raised, marking family territories and telling their histories. In 1864, missionaries arrived in Kincoleth, imposing alien teachings and disrupting age-old cultural traditions. The lives of the people were torn apart with fearful threats. In order for you to get into heaven, our people were told by the missionaries, you got to burn your regalia, the most sacred blanket of our nation. They burn your regalia. Cut down the totem poles and burn them. My brothers and sisters and I would play under my grandfather's house. What he had done with respect to the family totem poles, rather than cut them, just cut them down or burn them, he had cut them down and cut them in, in sections to be used as footings that would hold up his house. So here we are as children playing under the house and all of these creatures are looking at us made of wood. 
And we had no idea what they were. This was a sad time in the valley. Smallpox and measles ravaged the communities, and overfishing led to the closure of the Nass canneries. Many people found work at the canneries in Port Edward, but they yearned for their river and the valley of the Nass. The powerful Nishka leader, Chief Israel Skatin, led a delegation to Victoria to confirm the rights of his people to hold ownership of their land. But their claims were ignored. Dr. Frank Calder takes up the story. On the evening of a certain summer day, five people arrived on the opposite bank of Old High Ants. The people who were along the beaches, some of them sitting down on a nice grassy hillside, watched these people as they were pitching a tent. The chief told his braves to go across the river to find out what these people were doing. You see this little instrument here, we're looking through it to, to place a line on this side of the river. We're going down that way, and so far down that way, we're going to cross the river, and we're going to go behind your community, cross the river, and then we come back here. And Queen Victoria, our gracious queen, is going to give you this land. Out came the Hudson Bay muskets. No more conversation. And they pointed at those surveyors and says, get off my land. That was the birth of what is now known as the British Columbia land question. The surveyors continued their work establishing reserves across the province. The government in Victoria stepped up its policy of suppression of Aboriginal rights. Another misguided and cruel step was the residential schools program. Run for profit, its purpose was to eliminate the Indian problem. Overcrowding, sickness and abuse led to the deaths of thousands of children. New customs estranged the youngsters from their families and communities. They just told my, my parents to get me ready that they were going to take me with them. They come, come up to Kintola, take names, and the next thing you know, we were gone. As they packed my little bag, and whatever clothes I had, I was crying all the time. Chief Arthur Calder, whose own son had tragically drowned, adopted the young boy, Frank. He stood me on the table. And he told the big feast, I'm going to send this little boy to, to, to a white man's school. And he's going to learn how that white man walks, how that white man runs, what he eats, how he sleeps. I'm going to turn him into a white man. And when he comes back, you see that mountain over there? He's going to move it. So Frank spent years away from home and certainly fulfilled his father's wishes. But, he says to me, every time you come home in the summer, where you're gonna be in my sailboat fishing, I don't wanna hear one word of white man's language while you're standing on this boat. It's gotta be Nishka. If you forget about our custom, I'm here to teach you that. For 13 bloody years, I come home and I speak Nishka. I never forget my culture. I know who my chief was. I retained my identity. In 1913, Nishka leaders delivered a land claims petition to the Privy Council in London, England. After much internal correspondence, the bureaucracy in London ruled that the matter must first be dealt with by a Canadian court. Prime Minister Borden in Ottawa agreed to treat the matter with the utmost liberality, but nothing was done. The mood in BC was unsympathetic toward Indians. They were being marginalized. 
The door was closed until 1960 when there was a joint parliamentary committee set up to, to hear the conditions of the natives. We went and appeared in front of them in 1960 with only one subject, land question. We didn't ask them to reopen it. We just start talking about the land that we own. He believed in British justice, Dr. Calder. He said on many occasions, British justice will prevail. He believed that the laws of, of our counterparts, of the government, would prevail and that they would recognize that we are the true owners of this territory, this land. Yeah. There was a young fellow studying the Indian question by the name of Tom Berger. I had a, a, a little office in a two-story building. <laughs> it was a walk-up law office. I could still hear my footsteps walking up to the door. Well, is this the office where Tom Berger works? His answer was yes. Come on in. I don't know where they all sat, but uh, we must have found chairs for them all. And uh, uh, they made it clear that they wanted to, uh, to uh, sue uh, the province uh, to have the courts declare that their Aboriginal title still existed. So, to make the long story short, I looked at him and I said, you're hired. I said, well, okay, let's do it. I mean, uh, I was very young and, uh, and that's an advantage sometimes. You're not aware of all the obstacles that lie in wait. <laughs> at this stage, one of the obstacles was Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau himself, who said of Aboriginal land claims, our answer is no. If we sued and we lost, uh, it would be a great setback for uh, all the Indian people in BC. Chief Rod Robinson shared Berger's concerns and remembers those years. And this was the fear of the other First Nations right across Canada. I spent many days on the road lobbying to have the Niska case accepted and for them to dig into their pockets like us and uh, help pay the case. And I said, no, why are you get on the same case here? We don't want to go out down with the Niska. I went with them to some meetings of various Indian bands and tribes where they were much criticized. I remember uh, Frank Calder and Jimmy Gosnell uh, said, uh, well, uh, uh, what's the alternative? To do nothing and continue to, to uh, make protestations uh, every few years to the federal cabinet, which won't take us seriously because they don't believe in the concept of Aboriginal rights or Aboriginal title. Right from day one, Years before that, we were determined. There was no bad word from, from Webster's Dictionary that we adopted. We were confident we were going to go ahead and we were going to proceed with the business, and there's no word that's going to hold us back. And they showed that, uh, that uh, firmness of spirit, if you like, that has characterized the Nishkas in their long history. Dr. Calder was a believer in that. And uh, he led our people into the court cases here in British Columbia, the Supreme Court case where we lost. They tried again in the appeals court, and again we lost, and they entered the Supreme Court of Canada in Ottawa. We were flying down on the plane with the lawyers for the provincial government, traveling economy, and the lawyers for the province were in the first class section, but they came back to our uh, economy section to to uh, chat, and they said, oh, uh, we understand Emmett Hall isn't going to sit. Well, Emmett Hall had already made a name for himself as a champion of minority rights, and uh, uh, so that was a cause of great concern to us. 
We stopped in Toronto for a weekend on our way to Ottawa. And uh, Ken Lissick had uh, organized a gathering uh, of uh, two or three professors. And one of them said, well, my, uh, one of my students last year is now Emmett Hall's clerk. I'll phone and ask. So he phoned. And he came back and he said, he's sitting all right. He's, uh, he's been waiting for this case. So, uh, Six of the seven judges uh, accepted that the Nishka must have had Aboriginal title before the Europeans came. Uh, they said that's, that was their legal system, that was their concept of title. And uh, under English law, it would, uh, it would survive uh, the coming of uh, settlers from, from uh, England. Three of them said it was extinguished in the colonial era. And three of them, led by Emmett Hall, said, no, it wasn't. It still exists today. The seventh judge said that on a procedural question, we had uh, pressed the wrong button. And so we, technically, we lost. But we had opened up the whole question of Aboriginal title. I don't know about my other colleagues, but I was the one man that was extremely happy when it was three to three because of the guy sitting on my back on that confinement. I says, get off, mister. It's three to three. Let's face each other and let's talk. And that's what brought the biggest victory for the, for the Calder case known as negotiations. Calder and his colleagues uh, journeyed to Ottawa to meet with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau. And they sat across, no doubt, in the Prime Minister's office and Calder pointed at the Prime Minister. This is what you must do, Mr. Prime Minister following the Supreme Court judgment. Prime Minister Trudeau said, I've read this judgment, and uh, you, we really uh, can't ignore this any longer. And finally, I, Mr. Chrétien said, we're going to settle the uh, land claims all over the country. What started us, Calder and others, young men walking with their briefcases, down the road, trying to look important as we can. What started to be just a Nisca case turned out that it was the entire First Nation were the beneficiaries of that. The Nishka negotiating team started work on what was to be a 13-year marathon. Some of the more difficult moments included the many years during which the province refused to participate in negotiations, except as an observer. All the lands and resource um, issues and uh, education and uh, policing and uh, parks and subsurface resources and uh, water rights and all the issues around land and access were all provincial. When I became Premier in 1991, uh, one of the first acts was to establish the BC treaty process uh, to carry out negotiations with uh, First Nations around the uh, province and to uh, f start the negotiations separately in a separate process with the NISCA. The NISCA had extraordinary uh, longevity and continuity of their leadership, of their negotiators. They had a corporate memory uh, uh, that the federal and provincial teams by necessity lacked and the NISCA were able to bring to the table an overview of the goals and objectives of their nation in a way that allowed them to stay true to a principled position from the beginning all the way to final settlement. They had a vision of what they wanted and uh, they worked to achieve that vision so it wasn't just a matter of in my view of them wanting a treaty it was a matter that they had a vision that could be achieved uh, through the treaty. Just to sit at the table with each other represents a compromise from all points of view. The desire to reach an agreement that will be mutually satisfactory represents in some level a compromise. As we got into the substantive components of the agreement, uh, you could say almost every provision represents a compromise from somebody's point of view or another. You really have to get at what the other side's interests are. And that's uh, easier said than done. 
There was great interest in NISCA wanting to own the submerged lands. But from the province's point of view, we couldn't live with that at the end of the day. If you own the, the bed, well, you're the one who can authorize a dam. And the NISCA didn't want the province putting a dam on the Nass River. So you get to the bottom of all that, and then there are, then there are solutions. There are get to be all kinds of ways to skin the cat once you really get to the bottom of uh, what the concern is. The uh, NISCA delegates would ask for a moment to caucus, and the federal and provincial reps, or ministers as the case may be, would say, certainly, shall we leave the room? And the NISCA would generally say, no, that won't be necessary. And they would uh, discuss the matter in NISCA. And having resolved it after discussion, they would then announce the outcome of their deliberations to the other side. They had some very talented people at the negotiating table, band members, tribal council members, and, and consultants. Very, very talented people. I guess if they had one weapon, it was their sense of humor. When the going was toughest, uh, people would be surprised because the laughter would be the loudest as a way of letting off some steam, uh, letting any bad feelings go, and being able to return with a fresh mind to the job at hand. One time uh, we were flying to uh, Terrace and the flight had to be diverted to Prince Rupert. We ended up having to take a bus. So we sat at the back of the bus and just started uh, telling stories and uh, sort of interacting with uh, each other. And uh, from that time on, there was a real change in everybody's, uh, the trust relationship had gelled. We spent so much time together in all different parts of the province in uh, incredible circumstances um, uh, that we got to know each other very, very well. Um, and it's actually probably one of the principal reasons that the treaty finally um, was concluded. The, the deal almost slipped from our grasp at the last minute. We were, uh, we had a, an issue that uh, arose and uh, that uh, was a very contentious issue and uh, we weren't, uh, we spent an incredible amount of time on the phone and I, I had visions that the thing was going to go, it wasn't going to happen. And uh, then finally there was a knock at my door uh, it was Jim Aldridge, and he wanted us to go back down to the uh, treaty room where we had been negotiating. We couldn't possibly get through the lobby without people stopping us. So Aldridge said, let's go down the fire escape. So we get down there, and of course at the bottom there's a sign that says, this door is alarmed. And uh, Aldridge, I remember, turned to me and said, do you believe this sign, or do you not give a damn? And I said, let's go through. So we opened the door and nothing happened. Anyway, then we go into the room and uh, it was really tense. And uh, then it became clear that uh, the issue had been dropped and we were going to move forward and we had a deal. So we went from absolute fear and concern. Uh, we knew that uh, there were so many eyes on us. There was so many press there. The premier had arrived. Uh, it was quite a thing. And the Nishka dancers were out practicing in the parking lot across the street uh, in anticipation, not knowing how close it came to uh, failing. The final stop was Ottawa to present the negotiated and ratified treaty to the House and await the results of the vote. When the vote was taken and uh, my colleagues and I were sitting up in the gallery uh, as we watched, and I said to myself, I hope these people understand that what they're voting for means life or death for our people, whether we survive or not in the foreseeable future. That's what this thing is about, not just politics. The Speaker of the House declared that the settlement legislation had passed third and final reading. Well, it was a very emotional moment. It was just overwhelming. You know, I had tears welling up in, in my eyes, and 
I couldn't speak as the members of the House of Commons stood up and sang O Canada, I said. We stood up and sang with them. <laughs> Where do the Nishkas go from here? Well, that's up to them. They've always uh, uh, charted their own course. But they now have a treaty. They have the means to work these things out for themselves instead of simply awaiting the judgment of uh, Ottawa or Victoria or somebody else. You know, Canada is made up of multifaceted societies, and we're part of that, and a very proud part of it. So I think that uh, we have a heck of an opportunity up here to really show, I think, the world um, what it could be like. In recognition of the new status of the Nishkan nation, for the first time ever, the Governor General, who is the Crown's representative in Canada, paid an official visit to the NAS. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor and a pleasure on my part to officially welcome uh, Her Excellency, uh, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, onto Niska land and onto Niska traditional territory. You are the original people. You have been here since time immemorial. And we are part of that because you have allowed us to be. All of this is a negotiation. Negotiations can only happen among people who are equals and who trust each other. And that's what you as the Nishka people have taught us. That they can have an atmosphere of mutual trust and I think as the treaties proceed in British Columbia, this is, and for all of Canada looking on, we have to realize that that is a beacon light for us. Madam Clarkson visited all four villages in the valley meeting and talking with chiefs and children and many Nishka citizens. She enjoyed celebrations, feasting, drumming and dancing. This magnificent wooden structure, based on the principles of the longhouse, is home to the Nishka Lism's government. Nishka Lism's government is comprised of our legislature, which is our WSN, Wopsayagnaska, and our executive, uh, which is analogous to cabinet. And the cabinet meets month to month, and the legislature meets approximately quarterly. And um, on both of those bodies sit the elected representatives from the villages. Because of the price that was paid. And I think, uh, we're, we're, Government we're departments, such as this Nishka fishery the group, use the legislature for their meetings. You have, uh, $2 Our legislative debates are not like legislative debates that you see in Victoria and Ottawa. Um, there's a lot of emphasis placed on respect. There's growing stability and prosperity in the villages. But for future generations, major economic development is needed. Encouragement of local entrepreneurs, together with practical jobs and technical training for young people, will help support these objectives. If you look into that common bowl, you see in there equal opportunities, equality, that we are all equal. It's all in there. It's a rich ball. It's a sacred ball. We do have the resources to make this happen now. We have money. We have land. We have the ability to make laws, particularly in the Nass Valley proper here, uh, that, that assist development. They don't act, uh, the laws shouldn't be an impediment to development, but actually help open the doors for development. And we're starting to see that happen in different phases. The Nuska people have this drive. You know, we've got to get involved in education. We have to get involved in health 
We got to get into involved in the management of the resources of our territory. And one of those major resources is the fishery. The introduction and use of the fish wheel on the NAS has been a vital step in developing research strategies to monitor salmon runs and ensure sustainability. We uh, began pursuing uh, our, our role as managers in 1991-92 uh, during the negotiation process. And uh, with, with that, the, the attitude had already starting to, to move to the positive, whereby Canada would be our partners as managers. Essentially, after the first uh, year or two, we've had really modest inquiries from industry. There have been no conflicts in terms of executing the Niska fishery or the commercial fishery, and it, it's been essentially uh, uh, without issue. This is called IS Fishing, Inland Sales Fishing. Usually around July every year, they have six to nine fishing days. Each fisher is allowed to sell up to 600 sockeye pieces. I've, I've taken the day off work, part of my annual leave, to come out and partake in the Nishka fishery. And just to sit around on the beach, it's like picnicking, and then we make a bit of money on the side from it, so that's nice. We wouldn't have this opportunity to even have this kind of fishery if it wasn't for a treaty. And the economic development will come, not as fast as a lot of people would like, but um, I, I certainly believe that it's coming. Don't fall around, Gary. And here, the most up-to-date technologies are in use. 512, 533, and 587. 512 and 533 need to be done. And 587. Sophisticated telemetry systems are used to monitor the number of fish in the river, allowing for careful management of the stocks. Because this is seasonal employment, I wanted to try to uh, secure full-time employment, so just this year I went away to um, Malaspina College University, and I'm uh, presently taking the resource management officer's technology program. The steelhead. I'm trying to convince more of our my co-workers to go away and uh, take this program. Really? I, I think it would benefit our, benefit our program quite a bit. When I was going into my third year of university, the Niska Fisheries Program began. It was the first time that there was something in my home area that was a job that pertained to what I was studying. I remember There's this There's a room. Though. That's Teasel, yeah. Several of the Valley residents enjoy working with the school. This family welcomes the children to their property during recreation and read week, part of their social studies program. Are you going to hold him while we're riding him? As the treaty was being negotiated, some of the non-Nishka residents of the valley who own property and perhaps run a business were concerned, but their fears proved groundless. My s status hasn't changed a bit. I mean, when I can pass my trap line on to somebody else or, or uh, sell it, or, and uh, I come under provincial jurisdiction, so. Uh, even though I am right within the heartland of the, the Nishka Treaty. And uh, there's no more hassles over things like that since the treaty. Everybody's happy. We get along a hell of a lot better. And I think it's simply because there's some sort of an understanding and it's settled. The school system in the NAS encourages those who did not graduate from high school to further their education and earn qualifications to have a career perhaps as a teacher. Oh, I absolutely love teaching. Um, couldn't have made a better choice. <laughs> oh, and I love teaching our own children. The light bulb that goes off when a student gets something or has learned something, the joy on their faces when they're happy and proud of themselves. I think all of them are happy, 
I would love to see uh, full uh, bilingual houses, that's what I'm looking for, um, where parents as well as children as well as grandparents and some who are speaking uh, Niska fluently. I'm in grade 12 and I'm graduating this year and after I graduate I plan to probably go to the community college here and take up some courses of Nishka or learn more about our Nishka culture and then after that, after I'm done with what I'm doing over there, I plan to go to UBC for classical music for vocals. Oh no, somehow have my culture mixed in with my music and I want to show everyone that I'm native and I'm from the Nishka Nation. I absolutely think that the IU has uh, a place in, in modern uh, living, I guess. With the many changes that have gone on uh, within the school district 92, um, I have a lot of hope for the future. And I can see with a lot of the changes in literacy and numeracy, as well as other areas like language and culture, that um, we're headed down a very, very bright path. We raised a sacred totem pole that all uh, students from this school carved onto with the teachers. Back in the olden days, we weren't able to, to you know, do our our language, and we weren't able to do a lot of things. And now that we're able to carve our own culture and stuff and put it up and show off and we could sing it and we could dance it and we could speak it now, we're learning it, we're allowed to learn it in school. It means a lot to all the students. Dr. Joseph Gosnell, he always maintained a platform of education being key and in order to make this treaty succeed we need Nishkas to go out and and attain their education uh, levels, post-secondary graduate levels education and come back and, and make this treaty work. Gitwin Silk is uh, quite a unique community, Canada-wide I believe. We have approximately 220 individuals uh, living in the community uh, about 150 of them are children, so out of the remaining adults, there is, uh, the last count I heard about a month ago was 37 university degrees. Most of these students are, are sponsored by our village. We get a, a budget, and the unfortunate part is we always have more applicants than we have dollars. Um, last year we had 16 more applicants then we had dollars and, and a lot of those applicants were were good candidates, you know, you know they would have been successful. Well I'm working here at the school but it's for low wages and this village doesn't really have too much to offer for jobs, just the school. And so I only work short hours and well my family's poor so I have to help my dad put food on the table, so I don't know how I'm going to get to college, <laughs> but I hope to. Nestled in the bay and surrounded by mountains, Kincolith claims to be the seafood capital of the NAS. In strategies for economic development, this little village plays its part as a great tourist attraction. The annual Crab Fest draws more visitors every year. We still have some fresh crabs, and uh, they're still crawling up the beach. They're going right into the cooking pots. That's how fresh we can get them. The compelling scenery and good fishing attract travelers to the area from all over the world. 
This group of sport fishers is from Germany. The B&B business has long been established in the valley, and Lavinia's hospitality is world-renowned. Today, a group of Norwegian government officials arrive and will be treated to traditional and local specialties. We are the Justice Committee of Norwegian Parliament, and uh, last year the government uh, passed a bill about the Sami people in uh, northern Norway and Finnmark. They are traditional reindeer herders and uh, also fishermen and so on. And uh, they want to give, uh, uh, the government wants to, to distribute uh, rights to the Sami people more than before. So we have been looking into what Canada has been doing and the Nishka Treaty is of course the newest and very interesting for us to see how it's done here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's indeed an honor on my part to extend to all of you the uh, best wishes of the Nishka Nation located in northwestern British Columbia. The salmon that's being cooked around you came fresh from the Nass River yesterday. As indicated earlier, we value this particular resource. It has been the mainstay of our nation for literally thousands and thousands of years. The drum is the heartbeat of the Nishka culture. And the culture is like a river that flows through all of Nishka life. Our kids are wonderful. They can go and dance in the traditional regalia come out with uh, out of the change room after their performance and wear the Nikes and the, you know, the basketball hats and all that. They dance in both worlds because they now are proud of who they are, where they come from, and what they are. <laughs> 